As you come into the webinar, please feel free to drop your name in the chat or actually where you're from. We love to hear where everybody is joining from around the world. Um, that's so fun. So we are doing our webinar today on groups and games, as you know, um, before we dive into that. I'd just like to tell you about a few events that are coming up for Piano Safari. I'm so excited that my family and I are traveling to England on May 1st. And while I'm there, I'm doing um, three workshops. Two of them are with Sally Cathcart from the Curious Piano Teachers. And she's also the author of Ready to Play. So some of you may already use her material. And we are doing a presentation in Oxford and Manchester. Um, at the Oxford event, there's an online option. So I know many of you obviously probably are not from England who are joining us today, but you could join online if you're interested. Um, so we'll be talking about Ready to Play and Piano Safari Friends and how to use them together. And then at the end of May, I have another event in London with Juan Cabeza. Um, piano Safari publishes his material, Diversions and Piano Train Trips. Um, so that will be on May 26th in London. And you can find out more information about those um, on our website if you're interested. And also, um, much later in June, at the end of the month, Julie is coming to Ohio, my hometown here of Athens, and we are um, going to do the Piano Safari Summer Institute together here. So we would love for you to come learn more about Athens and Ohio University if you want to come in person. Um, but if not, we do have an online option for that also. So we're just really excited to do some online events um, and in-person events. It's been quite a while for both of us. All right, so just taking a look at the chat, we have people from all over the US. Welcome, we got, there's a London, um, Canada, other locations in the UK. Oh, we have someone from Italy and Israel. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, so I think without further ado, we can go ahead and get started. So Julie, why don't you introduce yourself first? Sure, I am um, Julie Haig, and I live in Connecticut here in, and I'm in my piano studio here. I teach a small number of students of all ages, and also, of course, I'm co-author of Piano Safari, and I do research on uh, pre-college piano literature as well. And um, when I'm not doing all those things uh, related to piano, I take ballet classes on Zoom, which has been great and love working in the garden with my husband because he really has a green thumb. So we're excited about planting our garden soon. And I'm Catherine Fisher. Um, so I live in Athens, Ohio, as I just mentioned earlier when I was talking about the Piano Safari Summer Institute. And as part of my responsibilities at Ohio University, I teach pedagogy and I also lead a practicum class with university students that are um, learning to teach and a group of preschool aged children. So you see them pictured here on the slide. So many of the videos you see today in the presentation will be from my Piano Safari Friends class. And it has just been an absolute blast to teach that. So throughout the course of our webinar today, please type any questions or comments that you have in the Q&A or the chat, and we'll be sure to leave time at the end uh, to answer those. So our session will focus on group classes for students between the ages of four and 10. We want to make this as flexible and useful as possible. So the ideas we provide today will work for different group sizes. With this said, we envision that most groups will contain between two to six students. As I mentioned a moment ago, at Ohio University, I teach a class of five preschoolers. And you'll notice in the videos we show that I also have four university teaching assistants. I know having this many teachers in a group setting is an unusual luxury, so be assured that the ideas we're sharing today will work with only one teacher as well. For groups of two to six students, one or two pianos are suitable. A digital piano lab is not necessarily a requirement to run a successful group class, but if this option is available to you, the ideas we present can be modified to fit that format as well. Personally, we prefer to use acoustic pianos for group classes with young children. We're often asked what materials we use to teach group classes. Most methods can be used for and modified for use with a group, but we use Piano Safari as our group class curriculum at Ohio University. 
We suggest that group classes always follow the same basic format. This provides consistency and helps students know what to expect. For example, in the group class I lead, the initial part of class consists of a greeting and opening activities, moving to music, and working with rhythm. These activities warm the students up, hopefully bring them to a point of concentration and readiness, and then set the stage for new pieces and concepts that will follow in the class. After working with rhythm, we move to the piano and learn a follow the leader piece or a rope piece, and we work with technique. During the last section of class, we spend time building reading skills, play an improvisation or ensemble, and often perform for each other. Throughout this session, we'll take looks at enjoyable and effective ways to facilitate each of these elements in a group setting. Sorry, I was muted. Design an area in your teaching space where your entire group can sit or stand together, preferably away from the piano. A large area rug is an easy way to designate the space. Assign each child a spot that they can return to immediately when asked. So much of successful group teaching is designing logistics so that things run smoothly with as little time as possible wasted on giving multiple verbal instructions. After the initial greeting, the opening activities for an elementary class begin with warm-ups that help students learn about the different joints and muscle groups they will be using to play the piano. For example, we begin with shoulders up and down, as Katie will demonstrate, forearms up, down, and rotate, wrists up and down, hands opened and closed, and finger, finger wiggles and finger circles. Let's watch a video from the beginning of Catherine's preschool class to see this in action. Good, shoulders up and drop. In which way do we want them when we play the piano? High or low? Low. Exactly. Let's put our forearms up like this. And we're gonna go up and down with our forearms like you're bouncing a basketball. Let's do imaginary basketballs in the air. Yes. Let's rotate, go up and down with our forearms. Yes, just like that. Okay, freeze. Now we're gonna move just our wrists. Just our wrists, oh yeah, a little movement, that's it. And now let's wiggle our fingers. Yes, good. Let's make finger circles with one and two. We can peek at each other. Guess what? After the warm-ups, we often leave the class in preparation steps for technique that will be introduced at the piano later in the class. For example, one technique we teach in Piano Safari is called the Lion Paw, in which students drop with arm weight to produce a full and ringing tone quality. Looks like this. In order to play this technique correctly, students drop with arm weight into the key using gravity rather than force. This is a sensation that's best learned away from the piano. One fun strategy is to use elastic headbands like this that you can just buy at a, a dollar store um, or order online. Assign each student a partner and give the pair a headband. One person holds the top of the headband while the other student places their arm inside, letting it hang loosely. And I found this works easier for young students to gain that sensation of relaxing their arm. Um, on top of an object. So let's watch a video of this in action. We, we did our lion paw. We did. We put our arms through and we had heavy, floppy lion paw arms. So I'm going to throw this to the teachers. Oh, okay. You're right. Right. Yes. Oh, oh, right. 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 Another technique we teach in Piano Safari is called the Tall Giraffe. In this technique, students play non-legato with a wrist roll off the last note of each group, which represents the tall neck of the giraffe. And that wrist roll is like the tall giraffe neck there. 
I introduced this to my group class by reading a brief story found in Piano Safari Friends, which is pictured here on the slide. We then work on the technique away from the piano using stuffed giraffes to help. This type of away from the piano technique sets the stage for skills learned at the piano later, and it only takes a few minutes at the start of each class. Later in the presentation, we'll show you some students actually playing these at the piano, um, but for now you can see the video of our preparation steps. So Jen Giraffe stands with her friend, George Giraffe. They watch as the tall giraffes reach up high to eat leaves off the very top of the trees. When will we be able to reach so high, George? So I'm going to put my hand right next to the giraffe's neck, okay? And then I'm going to pet my tall giraffe's neck with the side of my hand like this. This is a motion that we use on the piano. We're going to roll off of a note when we play. And our tall giraffe can teach you how to do that, okay? Okay, thank you. So you see how Mrs. Fisher does it? Okay. Another fun activity that works well in a group class is to have students decorate the piano, which helps them understand the keyboard layout and learn the names of the white keys. You can hand components of the piano decorating kit to the students who place them on the keys. Zebra triangles go on the groups of two black keys, giraffe rectangles on the groups of three black keys, and the letters are placed in relation to these black key groups. We're happy to announce that soon the piano decorating kit will be available on our website, pianosafari.com, for purchase in the U.S. in the next few weeks, hopefully. So look for that soon. You can do this activity all together as a class, or after the students have some experience with decorating the piano, you can place carefully selected pieces in cups for a small group of students to work on themselves while you are teaching a concept to a different group of the class. The students take down the cups in order to decorate the piano. This video shows a group class decorating the piano. Yes. Awesome. Oh, oh good. We have a chapel with one more. Perfect. All right. How many black keys do we have here? Three. Three. Those are the rectangles, the draft rectangles. So you can do those next. students' entire body understand meter and rhythm. This can be developed in a structured way by marching or swaying to the beat. Moving to music can also help students learn about mood and character as they express music through free movement. Let's explore both types. For structured movement, we found it easiest for students to form a line. To facilitate moving into position quickly, we suggest purchasing rubber floor spots and assigning each student a color. You will see these positioned on the floor in later videos. When the students are in position, ask the group to either march in place or march around the room. This can be done with an audio track if you want to march with your students, or you can play the piano if you feel they're able to find the beat well on their own. To make this even more engaging, the teacher can vary the activity by pausing the music at random points and asking the students to freeze until the music begins again. This encourages active listening, and the students have to find the beat over and over. Here's a video of my group class of four and five year old students tiptoeing to the music and freezing when the music stops. They're tiptoeing because the piece is called hide and seek. They're still learning to walk with the beat, as you will see, but this is a valuable activity because they're hearing the piece that they're actually going to be playing later in class. Now, when you're tiptoeing like you're being quiet and playing hide and seek, if the music stops, you have to freeze. And when the music starts, you tiptoe again. Okay?
For expressive movement, we choose music in different styles to keep things interesting and to introduce students to the idea that music is written with different mood and character. You can even get creative and use props, such as scarves for lyrical or flowing pieces, as we did here. Although there are myriads of possibilities for what music to use in the movement portion of class, we typically choose pieces that the students will be learning to play later in class. This gives them the opportunity to gain an intuitive and auditory understanding of the music before they actually play it on the piano. So let's move on and talk about rhythm activities. One of the most successful strategies Julie and I have employed throughout our years of teaching is to use a set of focused rhythm patterns at the beginning of study. When students master a group of commonly used rhythms by practicing them over and over again, we found that they develop a strong and confident rhythmic ability. In our group class for young beginners, we use the animal rhythm patterns. The animal names are related to the characters and technique found in Piano Safari Friends, our method for students ages four and five, and Repertoire Book One, our series for age six to 10. With this said, these rhythm patterns can accompany any method, and you can use whatever counting method you actually desire. I'll show you several of the activities we do while using these patterns. First, the group moves back to the rug and stands in place. I lead the group using body percussion, which basically means tapping or clapping using various parts of the body rather than only clapping using the hands. We do a rhythmic call and response or follow the leader, as we like to call it, so Julie, will you follow me? Charlie Chipmunk. Charlie Chipmunk. And then I might make it more fancy. Charlie Chipmunk. Charlie Chipmunk. So we proceed through the patterns using different parts of the body. So the students have to be attentive um, and, and also be able to copy the correct rhythm. A variation on body percussion is to use rhythm instruments. In this video, notice how Catherine's class is able to put together longer and longer strings of rhythms. The next video shows students working on rhythm playbacks at the piano. There are numerous games to play with rhythm. We will share one of our favorites. To play rhythm concentration, the teacher lays out rhythm flashcards face down on the floor or a table. There needs to be a match for each card. So for the animal rhythm patterns, we have the animal picture that matches each rhythmic notation. You can also do this with cards that have two cards that have the same notation. To play, each student takes a turn flipping over two cards and tapping the rhythms. Charlie Chipmunk. If the cards match, the student gets to keep the set. The next student follows the same process. Tall giraffe, it's a match. 
If the cards do not match, they are turned back over and left in place. Continue until all cards are matched. This game trains students to look for similar rhythms as well as to execute them correctly. We have just discussed what happens at the beginning of class, opening activities, moving to music, and rhythm. Now let's take a look at the middle section of class when students learn a follow the leader or a rote piece and work with technique. So we use the middle section of class to introduce a follow the leader piece, which is a new type of piece that we created for our book Piano Safari Friends. In a piece of this type, the student plays a short phrase and the student immediately imitates it right afterwards. These pieces provide even the very youngest student an immediate way to create music at the piano. To show you how this works, here is a video of a preschool student playing a follow the leader piece called Colors Shine. This is the same piece we heard earlier in the presentation when students were moving to music with the scarves. After watching this video together, we will suggest some ways to introduce this type of piece in a group class setting. Before working on a follow the leader piece with a group class, be sure the students have prior experience with the piece through listening and moving. After they have experienced the music through movement, they are ready to play it at the piano. We suggest setting up positions using floor dots. Each student has a different job. For example, if there are four students in the class, student one will sit next to the teacher on the bench to play the piece. Students two and three will play different rhythm instruments and student four will move to the music on the area rug. The students rotate through each role so that the piece is repeated four times and each student has a chance to move with the music, play two different rhythm instruments and play the piece at the piano. You can alter this any way you wish. For example, you may be able to have two students at the piano at once. You may be wondering how the students practice follow the leader pieces at home since this type of piece is entirely dependent on the teacher. We do suggest that the parent assist in practice for young beginners, so it may be possible for the parent to take the role of a teacher during practice if they play the piano. If not, however, we have created follow the leader videos for students to play along with at home, so we'll watch one together now. Rote pieces are based on common keyboard patterns and are taught without reference to the score. They differ from follow the leader pieces because students memorize patterns and play the entire piece rather than simply imitating the teacher in the moment phrase by phrase. In our group classes, we alternate weeks teaching follow the leader and rote pieces. Here's a video of a student playing a rote piece, playground fun, first on her own and then with the teacher accompaniment.
To teach a rote piece successfully in a group setting, it is important to think of creative ways to prepare students for the patterns away, for, away from the piano. For example, in Playground Fun, all the rhythms are based on the animal rhythm patterns we showed you before. So we introduce this piece with rhythm flashcards and percussion instruments. Charlie Chipmunk Roar, two, three, four. Charlie Chipmunk Roar, two, three, four. Then the next part is Tall Giraffe, Tall Giraffe, Charlie Chipmunk Roar, two, three, four. You can also do this with the actual rhythmic notation instead of animal pictures, especially if your students are a little bit older. After the students are familiar with the rhythm, they're ready to play on the piano. On the music rack, we place music alphabet cards with the letters of the starting notes. So we have the Charlie Chipmunk Roar 2, 3, 4 rhythm on C, and then again on D. Road pieces are taught in small phrases, so this is a good point to have the students line up and take turns playing this four measure group. If you have a second piano, you can have two students play at the same time. To set up, we place zebra triangles from the piano decorating kit. To mark the group of two black keys above the C and the octave that the students begin. Next, we place floor spots in front of the first and second piano. The remaining floor spots are next to the first piano. The teacher plays in a higher octave on the first piano and then cues the students who are playing. So I'd say, one, two, ready, play. Charlie Chipmunk Roar, two, three, four, and play along with them as they play their group on C and D. So every student in the class takes a turn rotating through each roll. To help students practice at home, we've also created reminder videos for all of the rote pieces that we teach. These serve as many video tutorials so that students are able to watch the video at home to be reminded of what they learned in the class. These videos are located on the Piano Safari website and on YouTube, so they're easy to find, but I also email the parents a link after class. I found that it's easier for them to implement during practice time if they already have it in an email along with the practice assignment. Here's an example of a reminder video for a rote piece. Playground fun starts with right hand finger two on C. So on C, we play Charlie, chipmunk, roar, two, three, four. Then we move up a note to D and play the same rhythm. Charlie, chipmunk, roar, two, three, four. Then we move up another key to E. This time we play a tall giraffe rhythm. Tall giraffe. If we think back to the opening activities at the start of class, the new technique, Lion Paw, was prepared in advance when we worked with elastic bands. The purpose was to teach students to keep their arms loose and heavy as they rested in the band. In the following video, watch how this student works on the Lion Paw technique at the piano. As you will see, the stuffed lion sleeps on the piano and only wakes up when she plays a correct Lion Paw drop with a loud sound and a loose arm. We often use props like this to teach technique to make it more fun and memorable for young students. You did. Okay, he's asleep now. You may have noticed that this student was using a very large motion for her lion paw drop. At the early stages of learning a technique, we feel that exaggeration of the motion is normal and even beneficial. It is easier to start with a large movement and then minimize it rather than starting with too small of a motion. This student continued to work on refining this technique in her future lessons. You may remember that the students also prepared for the tall giraffe technique at the beginning of class by listening to a story 
and learning the rolling motion of the wrist. At the piano, the wrist rule they learned is combined with non-legato articulation and uses the tall giraffe rhythm. Tall giraffe. Good, nice. Now what we're gonna do next is we're gonna practice the part where we're rolling up like the giraffe, gem giraffe is reaching for the leaves at the top of the tree. See that? Okay. Okay, so we do, I'm gonna put gem next to you. So come up like you're petting her. She's reaching, very good. Can you do that yourself? That is her neck roll, very good. Nice. Now here, I'll put her here, you can do your other hand, okay? Nice, giraffe neck roll. Good, okay, perfect. So I go first. In a group class setting, I would introduce these techniques in a similar way by working with students individually for a brief time. The other students in the group need a planned activity that they can do on their own, such as the decorating the piano activity that we spoke about earlier in the presentation. For a more advanced class, I would give the waiting students a theory assignment or have them analyze and mark their reading pieces or sight reading cards. So we'll provide more details about this in the next section when we talk about reading. To review our group class format, the beginning of the class contains opening activities, moving to music and rhythm. The middle section of the class contains either a follow with the leader or a rote piece, and then some work with technique. During the final portion of the class, students will work with reading, do an improvisation or ensemble, and then spend some time performing for each other. Teaching students to read notation will be a substantial part of your group classes. Because of the time involved ensuring that all students in the class have thoroughly mastered each reading concept, as you plan your classes, emphasize quality of instruction over quantity of pieces. You will likely not be able to cover the same number of pieces you would in a private lesson because forward progress would be too slow. Instead, focus on fewer pieces and teach them thoroughly. Carefully plan your introduction of each new concept. Reserving the time to teach each concept thoroughly will take longer at the outset, but will yield quicker progress in future classes. Students learn at different paces. Handle the various levels in a class by adding layers for each student, which we will discuss in a moment. Logistically, here are some ideas for teaching reading to a group. We use the Piano Safari sight reading cards for our group classes and students enjoyed having a portion of the class where they work individually at their own pace through the cards. So each card has a right hand reading example, a left hand reading example, and then a rhythm tapping exercise across the bottom. So hand each student a different card and then have them go to their assigned table spot to work on the right hand exercise. Students practice tapping the finger numbers on their own playing the right hand melody three times correctly. When a student is ready, he comes to the piano and plays for the teacher. If the student plays the exercise well, assign him to next practice the left hand exercise. If not, have that student practice the right hand exercise three more times and then come to the piano to try again. The teacher must be swift and efficient in offering instruction to each student to keep the line moving. Some students might complete one to two cards in the 10 minutes assigned to this reading activity, while others may complete four or five cards. When the whole class is proficient at reading these black key pre-staff exercises, you can move the entire class onto the next level of cards, which have pre-staff on the white key exercises. At the end of the time allotted for this activity, gather the students at the piano and count the rhythm tapping exercises together on the fall board. To introduce a pre-staff reading piece, use the following steps as a class. At their assigned table spots, each student has their own book. Okay, pianists, put your finger on the first note on your book. Point to each note and say the finger numbers with me. Ready, set, here we go. Two, 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 three, 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 four, two, three, three, three. I 
was pointing at my imaginary book. I don't have one here, but the <laughs> students would be pointing at the book on the table. <laughs> okay, students, now raise your right hand. Play the finger numbers in the air. Ready, set, here we go. Two, 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 three, 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 four, two, three, three, three. Great work. Now everyone put your right hand on a table in a good fuzzy house position. Practice playing the finger numbers with a bouncy arm on your own. Etc. The students practice on their own for 30 seconds or so. Now as our last step before we play it on the piano, let's play together on the table. Ready, set, here we go. Two, two, two. As a final step, bring the students to the piano and then play the piece in rotation. Start with a student whom you know will play well so that the students who are less proficient can watch before their turn comes. After all of these preparation steps, however, it's likely that most students will play ocean animals on the piano easily at their first attempt. In subsequent classes, review the piece of the piano, rotating through the students. This brings us to an important point about layers of learning, since each student learns at a different pace. You can provide individualized attention by requiring various, various layers of challenge for each student. For example, if student one learns quickly, you could give a challenge to play this right hand piece hands together in parallel or contrary motion. And if student two learns more slowly, set a slow and careful tempo with your accompaniment. Or if students three and four are both super fast learners, you could have them play this together in ensemble. As we said before, it's important to aim for quality over quantity for reading pieces. So you might work on this one reading piece for several weeks until all students in the class can confidently play it rather than trying to cram four reading pieces into your class. As you review the piece, you can add extra layers of individualized challenge according to the student's ability and their comfort level. For example, you might expect your less proficient student to be confident at playing at a moderately slow tempo with all the correct notes and rhythms. While your fastest students may attain technical perfection in their hand shape, strong fingertips, and be able to play hands together at any tempo you set, and perhaps even with their eyes closed, if they've practiced this piece long enough and know it by memory. Once students have attained the level that you set for them as individuals, you may introduce a new reading piece to the entire class. These same ideas can be applied to teaching music on the staff. Here are some steps for previewing the right hand of this card as a group. Okay, class, color the treble clef sign red. Raise your hand when you're done. Write G above the first note, treble G. Raise your hand when you're done. Mark the sames, unisons, with green. Raise your hand when you're done. Now point to the first note, treble G. Point to the notes as I play. Ready, set, go. G, up, 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 same, 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 down, down. Now play on the piano on the table as I play on the piano. Ready, set, go. G up, 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 same, 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 down, down, down. You can then leave the class in marking the left hand in a similar fashion. After the marking is complete, bring the students to the piano to play in their rotation. After several cards, the students can mark the cards on their own and work at their own pace as described for our pre-staff sight reading cards. The same steps work for previewing pieces on the staff. The more steps you use, the more confident all the students will become. 
Alongside the reading pieces, you can reinforce basic reading concepts through playing games. Children learn through play, so not only are games a fun addition to class, they help students learn and reinforce reading skill. Here are two of our favorites. First, the hiding game. Hide the cards around the room. We like this game because it's so versatile. Any cards will work. You can use letter name cards, interval cards, note name cards, chord cards, rhythm cards, whatever reading skill that you're working on. The children look for the cards and when a child finds one, they bring it to the piano to play it or say it for you. And then they go to look for another card until all the cards are found. Here's a video of my group class playing the hiding game with the animal rhythm pattern cards. Okay, okay everybody, open your eyes. And ready, set, go find the card. Okay, so let's try. You ready? Put your head together. video, my students were using both the animal pattern cards with the pictures and the notation. So I introduced it um, first with just orally with body percussion, and then they learned it with the animal picture, and then they learned the corresponding notation. So at this point in the year, they were finding both and um, playing the rhythm from that. Another fun reading game is called the fishing pond. So to play, you spread cards on the floor, and this is your fishing pond. This game is also versatile and can be used with any kinds of cards. Note named cards are in this fishing pond. The children take turns catching a card, also known as a fish, with a sticky hand as they cast the hand at the cards. So you cast the card, the fishing rod like that and it catches the card. The child or the class says or plays the answer and then the next child gets a chance to catch a card. Repeat until all of the cards are caught. One note about sticky hand. If you're fishing on your floor, the hand is liable to become a bit dusty over time, but you can wash it with dish soap and hang it to dry and it will return to its former stickiness. And this game is such a favorite with children universally, it seems, um, and they ask to play it over and over. So we recommend it. The next part of class is devoted to improvisation or ensemble playing. One of the easiest types of improvisations to do is the, on the black keys. If the student only plays the black keys, anything they play will fit the teacher accompaniment, which provides the rhythmic and harmonic foundation for the improvisation. So this is Dawn on Emerald Lake from Piano Safari Level 2. And at the end of the recital featured in this next video, I asked anyone who would like to improvise to line up at the piano. The first little girl you will see is very conscientious, as you will notice in the four bar phrases she creates. The next girl is older and loves to compose pieces. You will hear how she is clearly thinking out her melodies as she plays them. The last little girl also loves to compose. In the moment of this recital improvisation, she decided to see how much mileage she could get out with just two notes. Ensembles for group classes come in three forms. 
The easiest ensemble experience is when students play the same piece at the same time. The teacher accompaniment keeps the rhythm and makes it sound more musically interesting. This can work with any piece they know well, such as Charlie Chipmunk, a rote piece. Each student is assigned to play the piece in a different octave. The next level of ensemble experience is for a piece to divide, be divided into sections with each student playing a part in alternation. I Love Coffee, arranged by Bernard and Carolyn Schock and in Piano Safari Level 1, is made of six variations. In this video, you will see how the children rotate through each variation and play their assigned portion. <laughs> The most complicated ensemble experience is when students play different parts at the same time, what we generally term as an ensemble, such as this arrangement of Old MacDonald Had a Farm by Laura Silva. So let's talk a bit about performance. Group classes are the perfect setting for students to learn to play for others, since the environment is familiar and less intimidating than a recital venue. I incorporate a short performance time in most of my group classes. For this preschool class, I also emphasize how to be a good audience member, and we go over that every time. <laughs> the listening students choose a stuffed animal and they learn to sit quietly and listen as their classmates play. I incorporate the stuffed animals because the students enjoy them and they also need to teach their animal to listen quietly and respectfully during a performance along with them. We also teach students how to bow correctly and we work on this skill immediately before starting the performance time. One way to make this portion of the class fun is to use uh, piece cards, which are little cards that have the name of the piece written on them. And we do sell these um, with all of our materials for level one, two, and Piano Safari friends, um, or you can make your own. So students put their piece cards in a basket and close their eyes and draw one out. They play whatever is on the card. As you can imagine, this also encourages regular practice and review at home. Before we do this activity in class, I always email the parents and provide a list of what pieces could be selected so that the students feel prepared. So here's a video of some of these things in action. Someone remind me how to be a good audience member. Be quiet. Be quiet and listen for me. <laughs> Don't talk. Don't talk. Be quiet. Rose, do you have one? Uh, don't go like You make a very good point. We don't want to wiggle our bodies around and just go crazy, right? We're going to sit quietly so our ears can listen and we can show respect to the person who is playing, okay? Yeah. All right, you are us. Okay, ready, go. Yes, excellent. So we play. group classes are also an option. 
During the pandemic, when I was teaching online, I began to have monthly performance classes on Zoom. This was so successful that even though the students now have their lessons in person, we still have the monthly online performance class. Although having class in person would be ideal, many family schedules are too busy to allow for extra events during the school week. However, it is easy for them to log on to Zoom, no traveling required. Because of this, I have had great attendance classes at my Zoom classes, attendance rates. Although the, there are issues with sound and internet connection, I have found that the benefits have outweighed these challenges and our monthly Zoom class has become a joy to me and to the students. Here's how it works. The class is free of charge and open to any of my students who can attend. My current students range, range in age from eight to 71. Class lasts 20 minutes because a short class is best when online. Before class, I write the names of the student and the piece they will play on little slips of paper and put them in my flamingo hat. Two brothers have their lesson right before class, so they stay in person and are in charge of pulling the names out of the hat to see who plays next. I spotlight the person who plays and mute everyone else, and then everyone applauds and we move on to the next performer. Sometimes I play as well, spotlighting my hands. I have found that the students are so kind to each other. The 71-year-old student will say, you play so musically, and the 14-year-old boy responds, those grace, no grace notes you play sounded great. I had those in a piece too. An 11-year-old loves to do interpretive dances to everyone's performances, and we even had a guest appearance by one of my students' dog, Jesse. This is probably the absolute easiest form of group teaching that you could incorporate into your studio with hardly any planning. I hope you'll consider trying online performance classes if you haven't already. Since students in group classes become so comfortable playing for each other, a more formal recital is something everyone looks forward to. My class of preschoolers had no prior experience with even attending a recital due to pandemic restrictions. After all, they were only two or three in 2020. I asked them if they had been to a performance before and only one girl um, answered and she said that she saw the marching band at a football game. So that was their only context. So to make their very first recital memorable, one of the teaching assistants in my class had the brilliant idea of writing a story about the animals from Piano Safari, and then she incorporated the rhythms, songs, and concepts covered in class into the story. So this video shows a few highlights from that recital. One chilly fall day, the Piano Safari friends woke up to play. Everyone was excited for the day. Zachariah Zebra. Gem Giraffe. Herbie Hippo Ready, go. and Christabel Kangaroo. Ready, go. It was a beautiful day and all the fall colors were shining brightly. It was such a lovely day that the friends decided to run to the playground to have some fun. When they got to the playground, they realized they were missing some of their friends. They looked to the left. They looked to the right. They looked up. They looked down and they realized they were missing Charlie Chipmunk. Ready, go.
we had some of the graduate students incorporated in that last song because three of my students were sick uh, for that final recital, three out of six. So um, that's why we had some different heights there. So to summarize some of our ideas throughout the session, one main point was to design group classes so that they always follow the same basic format. This provides consistency and helps students know what to expect. Set up the different elements of the class so that earlier concepts support later concepts. For example, the first part of class begins with opening activities, moving, and rhythm. The middle part of the class brings students to the piano to learn to follow the leader or a rope piece and work on technique. And the class ends with reading activities and improvisation or ensemble and performance time. So of course you can adjust this basic format for what would work with you and your studio, but um, we do like to keep it the same um, every time. Teaching group classes for beginners at the piano can be a wonderful experience for teachers, students, and parents, and this format is able to set up students well for all their future study. So that concludes our presentation, but now we're going to have some time for question and answer. So I'm going to stop my screen share here. Yeah, I saw some really great questions um, coming through here in the chat as we were going. So let's pull this up. and. All right, um, here's one from Angelina. Do you do group lessons for long periods of time? And she says she did a six week series of online group classes using Piano Safari level one, repertoire one, but had a difference in student ability and interest and decided not to go into a part two. So if students are advanced compared to others in the class, do you recommend they switch to private lessons? So that's a great question. Lots of um, good things to talk about there. My group classes, in terms of the period of time, it was a commitment for the, um, the school year. So I had a fall semester and a spring semester, um, and we meet every week. So um, the students in the class that you saw, they actually have a 30 minute private lesson, and then they have about a 25 minute partner lesson with one of my graduate assistants. So um, I know that's a setup that not everyone can replicate, but they do commit for the year to the group class. Um, and then in terms of different levels, um, we do limit it for the age range and say, for example, that they have to be brand new beginners. Um, so at least when they come in, um, one student has, hasn't had a vastly amount, uh, different amount of experience than another. They do progress at different rates. So sometimes I try to challenge my more advanced students by actually giving them like an independent piece to learn from a reminder video, for example, um, or you know, as we talked about in the presentation, just modifying, um, working on the same material, but modifying your expectation for each student slightly. Julie, do you have anything to add to that? No, there's so many different configurations of group classes that uh, you have to be flexible at designing um, what, what would work for a group of students, but we have found it best to keep the age and the level the same for the students. So um, I've taught classes that the students have a group class once a week and they have a private lesson once a week and then some where they only have the group class with no private lesson. Um, so there's lots of different ways to set it up. Um, I did say I saw a question that's quick to answer about how do you do the accompaniments when you're doing a zoom performance class with the student basically you can't. So um, that's one of the drawbacks to the Zoom performance classes that you can't really play accompaniments with them, except for my two boys that stay after their lesson in person. Um, but still, I found that the benefits of having the Zoom class outweigh any kinds of difficulties that you would have with Zoom, um, just because it's so hard to, to schedule the students to come in an extra time for an extra event unless it's required, which at one point in my career, I did require the students to come to a lesson and a group class every week, but that was only a very limited amount of students that could actually commit to that. So um, here in Connecticut, it seems like students are busy, their schedules are booked every single day. So um, it's even, it's not possible to have them come twice a week that I found. Um, and then there was another question about our, our, our parents expected to attend every class and Catherine can address this too, but I did have a class once in Missouri, where I had, uh, I think it was six little boys who were six and seven years old I don't know why the class ended up being all boys that's just the way it ended up. And um, 
I had the parents attend that just for be helping with behavior. So it was really fun because at the beginning of class, we all got in a circle and did our warm up activities, the parents and the kids, and then the kids could sit with the parent um, while we did the rest of class. And it really helped with um, their behavior and attention. Um, and the parents enjoyed it too, but it's not necessary to have the parents attend. Do you have anything to add, Catherine? Yeah, for my group classes that we showed videos of, I don't have the parents attend. Um, that's because I have those graduate assistants there to assist me. And I also have pedagogy students observing the class. So if I added parents into that also, it'd really be quite a large number of adults in the room um, per the number of children that I have. Um, but I don't say that the parents cannot attend. So if there was a parent who wants to come, of course, I would allow them to do that. It's, it's just not a requirement. And despite the fact that I've had um, four and five year olds in my class, they really have done a surprisingly great job with their behavior. Um, they, especially in the first semester, they were very serious and they, um, they listened to instructions well. And you know, now at the end of the spring term, they know us a little better. So there's some higher energy going on in the room <laughs> that we try to, try to um, you know, help them harness. But, but in general, it's gone very well. So. another question you want to yeah. answer julie here's a question do you sell the stuffies or recommend where to get them we get this question all the time uh, the stuffed animals we do not yet sell them um, so you just have to go on a treasure hunt to different stores or online stores to find the stuffed animals but hopefully eventually we will and the same with the sticky hand i saw a couple questions about that um that's I pretty think, easy to find usually just like i think someone yeah, I think someone posted a link, but you could just Google it on Amazon, like sticky hand looks like yeah. this. Yeah, and mine, I found sticky frogs. They're like little frogs attached to a, a string. I don't know why. That's what I found in my party store. So, you know, it kind of went with the piano safari theme. But, um, all right. So how about this question? How much time do you schedule for your group classes? Is there a recommended time you find works best? Somewhat depend on the age of the student. Um, my preschoolers, the class is an hour, um, but as I mentioned earlier, the first 30 minutes is the group and then the second part of class, they go to another room with the teacher to have a partner or private lesson. So they're changing their environment a little bit. It's still hard for them to concentrate well all the way through to the end. Um, but if I was just doing a group class only, I think I would do more of a 45 minute group class for the preschoolers, just so I don't feel rushed and so that there's time at the beginning and end just where you can talk to parents and, um, and I think that's what I would do if it was a group class only. Of yeah. course, for students who are a little older, 60 minutes probably for your average age beginner. Yeah. Class. Several years ago, I had uh, some group classes at the Hart School. Um, I had one with seven, six and seven year olds and then one with eight and nine year olds, four kids in each class. And they only had the group class with me, they did not have a private lesson. And we went for an hour and we we could have gone longer. <laughs> they, all, they always were like, what class is over already? Wish we could go longer. But an hour really helped me get through um, what I needed to because we didn't have any private lesson component. Mm -hmm. um, here's a question. How do you deal with students who miss classes either through sickness or some other reason? How do they catch up when they rejoin the class the following week? Uh, so I surprisingly, other than that end of the year recital, I've hardly had students miss, um, which is amazing in this day and age. <laughs> but um, it, when one did miss, it was usually only for one week. And um, I send weekly email links and assignments to the parents right after the class. So um, the parents are very invested in helping their four and five year old practice as they would need to be with the child that age. And, so they um, have helped keep the kids on track and I haven't had trouble with them rejoining the group and just, you know, coming right back up with the rest of the group the following week. Do you have any insight on that, Julie? Yeah, I also had very good attendance at the classes. One modification I did made, make when I was at heart, for some reason I had a few students that came consistently a little couple minutes late to class. So my structure for the class started with the sight reading cards at the beginning, the first 10 to 15 minutes of class so that as they came in, they, I could just hand them a card and they could go start working on their own through the card. Um, so that way late students weren't um, 
not weren't missing anything except part of the sight reading time time which they caught some of it so they were there for some of it and they weren't interrupting any other activities um, because every class that i'm sure each of us have taught follows a different format um, so this format that we presented today really worked well for Catherine's preschool class um, and it can work well for older ages too but you can modify the format and the number of activities of course to fit your class this should be very flexible this is not a one size fits all for sure even a different class of the same age might need a different format because all the kids are so different so I'm just jumping over quickly to the Q&A because um, we have the chat and the Q&A going. Um, yes, this webinar will be um, available. We'll post the replay link later on Teaching Piano Safari, which is our Facebook group. And then if you're not a member of that group, um, you can either join or you can email me at info at pianosafari.com and I will send you that replay um, link personally. So let me put that in the chat. There's one question, how many students in a group class? We found that four is ideal, but you can have two or three or maybe up to six. But if you do have a lot of students, it'd be helpful to have a teaching assistant or a parent um, to help with that. Unless you're extremely good at classroom management and can handle 30 kids all at once, like classroom teachers, I don't know how they do it. <laughs> but we found that four is pretty much ideal. So a couple more questions from the Q&A. Um, someone asked about the weight of the scarves um, and the size and weight could affect the movement. Is it important to choose different weights or sizes or try them to match the music? Um, that's a really good thought. I don't think I thought that deeply about it. I just brought the scarves I had around the house and I just wanted them to get the, the feeling of something um, lyrical and free and floating. So um, probably in the context of my group classes, any scarf will do, I would say, um, that would catch the air if that's your goal for that. But that was a great and insightful question. And then another person asked about the follow the leader recordings um, online that the students can play along with during the week. And she feels they're a little bit fast. Um, is there a way to slow them down? So um, I don't believe that we can slow down reminder videos on YouTube. Um, however, if you purchase the uh, accompaniments that I created to go along with the book, um, I believe they're $4.99, they're all of the teacher parts. You can get apps that slow down MP3s um, and you can play along with it. And also um, in SuperScore, we have some of our books available. SuperScore, uh, for example, if you open up Repertoire 1, the students can play along with the piece. You can choose any tempo um, to play along with. So. There's capabilities for that, just not necessarily in the reminder video. Though some people are posting now that you can slow down videos on YouTube. Wow, I, I did not know. I've That's never done that before either, but apparently there's a way, so. Okay, yes, you can try that. <laughs> Julie and I will go try that. Yeah. Um, that's, that's cool. Nice. Yeah, for, uh, in the Piano Safari Friends book, which is our method for preschoolers, um, they have the rope pieces that they should be practicing at home. Um, the follow the leader pieces, it's sort of optional to practice them at home um, since they're so teacher dependent. But in case parents wanted their child to practice them at home, we made those videos. So it's not, you must practice the follow the leader pieces at home. They're more um, musical um, experiences at the lesson. So it would probably depend on the student whether they would be able to, to use them with the video or should just do those pieces at the lesson. So um, thank you everybody for coming today. I know that we um, have not got through every single question, but we'd love to hear from you. I dropped my email in the chat there if you'd uh, like to write with your question again. I'm sorry if we didn't get to it. Um, so th yes, thank you again for your attendance. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. And um, like I said, we'll be posting the replay later. Thank you. Right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your kind messages.